In this video, we'll take a look at sustainability, which is standard level content from D4.2 on stability and change. Now we know that one of the things that can disrupt ecosystems is the removal of materials. So in order to promote ecosystem stability, we need to make sure that the harvesting that we do is sustainable. And that means that the rate at which we are removing materials is less than or equal to the rate at which they can be replenished. Okay, so the replacement rate must be greater than or equal to the rate that we're harvesting. So for example, um, this tree produces Brazil nuts and Brazil nuts are a highly profitable um, and delicious food. Um, so the, the first impulse here is if the, you're someone who wants to harvest and sell Brazil nuts is to take all of them. That's not sustainable. The sustainable method for harvesting would be to leave enough of these on the tree so that they can then grow into new trees. Another example of sustainable harvesting is cod. Cod are fish, they look like this, and at many times um, in the history of interactions between humans and cod, the cod population has been very impacted by over harvesting. So in order to promote a sustainable population, we need to be careful about how much we're harvesting relative to the rate by which it can reproduce and replenish. So some strategies that have been effective um, are protecting breeding zones. So no fishing where they are reproducing increasing the net hole size, okay? So if I want to catch cod using a net, um, I want the holes to be um, big enough to where smaller, young, juvenile cod can escape, right? So then you're leaving individuals that can survive and reproduce and replenish the population setting harvesting limits, and just monitoring populations. That monitoring might um, inform what the harvesting limit is for next time. We have a growing human population and humans have to eat. And so it's a good idea to keep an eye on sustainable um, aspects of agriculture or food production. Now, there are some things that um, factor into how sustainable agricultural practices are, like soil erosion. So tilling, that's what we're seeing here. So tilling is a process by which you turn the soil um, at the end of a season usually. Um, that tilling process can help you grow crops, but it also causes soil loss. Nutrient leaching happens when fertilizers from nearby farms leach into bodies of water. So things like nitrogen, let's say, might come in uh, or might be present in the fertilizer on a nearby farm and then rainwater washes it into a body of water and that causes eutrophication. So something to keep an eye on. Um, pesticides and other pollutants and the carbon footprint. So we're looking at how much energy and fuel it takes to keep that agricultural process going. These are all factors that we need to consider when we're evaluating an agricultural practice for its sustainability. So let's talk about eutrophication in a little bit more detail. Um, Fertilizers that are used on farmland are typically very rich in things like nitrogen and phosphorus. And when it rains, these phosphorus and nitrogen rich fertilizers run off into bodies of water. Normally, algae populations are kept in check by the absence or the limitedness of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so without that limited factor, the algae blooms, and that means that it's growing a lot and it grows on the surface. The reason why that is really important is because light that would normally be able to penetrate all um, depths of this body of water is then blocked by the algae on the surface. That will cause plants that live at the bottom of that body of water to die. Then they are decomposed and that decomposition process consumes all of the oxygen. This increases what we call the BOD, the biological oxygen demand. And without the presence of oxygen in the water, we're going to see the deaths of things like invertebrates, fish, and other organisms. 
The presence of pollutants is also um, a factor from agriculture that we really need to keep an eye on. So we're going to talk about two major processes here that happen with these pollutants. Bioaccumulation is exactly what it sounds like. It's the accumulation of toxins in living things throughout, well, throughout an organism's life. So over time, if this fish, let's say, is constantly exposed to toxins, it will accumulate higher and higher toxin levels in its own biomass over time, especially for toxins that are fat soluble or remain in tissues that aren't just excreted. So in an organism's lifetime, they can accumulate those toxins in their fatty tissue. Biomagnification is a process that accumulates these toxins, but through trophic levels, not in an organism's lifetime. So remember, because of the loss of most of the energy and those oxidizable carbon compounds, um, things at a consumer level have to eat many more producers, and then the next level has to eat many more of these, and then the next level has to eat many more of these. Those toxins then start to accumulate due to eating these individuals that also have toxins stored in their tissues. And so especially for organisms that are at the top of the food chain, things like DDT, which is a pesticide, or mercury, all of those things which are able to remain in tissues tend to be magnified at the top of the food chain. So we know pollution affects the sustainability of ecosystems. We're gonna look particularly at oceans and the effect of plastics. So plastic tends to accumulate because it does not break down. It's not what we call biodegradable. Plastic waste in oceans in particular can release toxic compounds, which can accumulate, so bioaccumulate throughout an organism's lifetime, and then also um, magnify its effects further up in the food chain again because they don't break down. Plastic pollution can be divided into two categories. Macro means large. So macro plastic are these large visible plastic wastes, like I'm seeing this plastic bag here. There are a few different problems with this. So um, organisms could ingest these things, thinking that they are food and could disrupt uh, their digestive systems. They can become entangled in these macro plastic um, pollutions. So definitely a big problem. Microplastics are small, micro means small, so we're not able to see these. These are very small plastic fragments that come from the degradation of larger pieces. Not the total breakdown, because plastics don't totally break down, but they can um, be broken into smaller pieces, and that's where we get microplastics from. Microplastics are prolific, and that means that they are found everywhere. Every body of water has some trace of microplastics in it, and we're also able to measure microplastics in animal tissues. Now, what we don't know is the effect of these microplastics. And so because that effect is yet to be determined, it's definitely something that we should keep an eye on um, and really try to limit how many microplastics and plastics in general are making its way into these ecosystems. Now, let's take a look at this ecosystem. This is a golf course, and this is not a stable ecosystem, and we know that because it requires a lot of human intervention to maintain. Now, if we want to work towards maybe reestablishing sustainable ecosystems, then we want to look further into this process called rewilding. Rewilding is removing the effects of human intervention to allow natural processes to restore ecosystems. So it's important here to understand that we're trying to get natural processes to take back over, to erase the human intervention um, that we're currently seeing in scenarios like this or farms, et cetera. So there's a couple of different things that you would want to do. Um, you would want to stop those human activities and then you want to maybe perhaps reintroduce species like a keystone species or an apex predator that might have been removed. You should distribute seeds of plants that should occur there, so naturally occurring plants that are endemic to the area. 
controlling invasive species that might have made their way there via human intervention, and then reconnecting habitats that have been separated due to human intervention. So the goal of rewilding is to really return that ecosystem back to its natural status. And a great example of rewilding can be seen in the Hinawai Reserve in New Zealand. And so this saw a shift from farmland back to the native forest using some of these strategies. So they removed alien or invasive species like goats that were out competing native species. They allowed naturally occurring species to outcompete those alien species by returning the habitat to its original or natural state. So remember that these naturally occurring, these native species are going to be well adapted for the natural ecosystem. And by allowing that natural ecosystem to return, you're then allowing them to outcompete those invasive species. They also re removed the effects of human intervention. So all farmland has seen human intervention. So by removing those effects of intervention, you really get this return to the natural processes using what's really an anti-management technique, okay? Not a lot of human intervention there. And so we really see theme D playing out again, continuity and change. Ecosystems do change over time, but they are stable in the long run when um, fewer disruptions can take place.